everyone. Um, this, of course, is Daryl. He didn't introduce himself. This is Daryl Duick. I'm Cheryl Duick. Um, and with us, we have Doug McClement. He is, he's got an amazing history. He is an audio engineer, but this guy, uh, I would say he's, I don't want to say the most wanted, but the most sought after um, audio guy. He's, he's been in the business for, I'll say, 40 years or more. And he started doing studio audio work um, just in the basement of his home. He eventually graduated, well, graduated, but moved on into more live, uh, live remote work um, with basically live recording. And he's the choice, the choice, he's an award-winning audio engineer. He is the choice audio engineer for events like the Olympics, and for the Junior Awards. He's worked with several different artists, uh, including Blue Rodeo, for those of you who like country music, and also several gospel artists, including Israel Houghton. Um, I had so many names, Faith Carell, uh, Toronto Mass Choir, our very own Toronto Mass Choir. He's worked with so many of them. Uh, we just wanna say welcome, Doug. <laughs> oh, it's a pleasure to be here. So I would like to jump in right away. Um, our topic tonight is mixing. Um, and we have a lot of up and coming people who've learned and wanting to learn how to mix, singer songwriters, and just people who actually have studios. So what would be cool to know is just to put us all on the same playing field, what's the difference between mixing a live show, mixing live for an album, uh, mixing in the studio, and then mixing for the stream? Because you do, I don't know if you do actually live shows, but you're pretty much cover the other three. Yeah, um, well, there are, there are three different mediums and you have to slightly change what you do depending on what your listener is listening on. And that even goes for music recording, you know, like obviously if you're mixing country records, most people are going to hear that in the car first. If you're mis mixing dance records, they're going to hear that in a club and that's a very different speaker system. If you're mixing um, Mariah Carey or, or Beyonce, a lot of people are going to hear that in earbuds before they hear it on anything else. And so you have to kind of listen in that mode to make sure that your ultimate listeners are, uh, uh, well, that your monitoring system and your control, you're making decisions based on what you're hearing. And so your decisions have to uh, match sort of what your listeners are, are listening to. And, uh, and so um, in the case of worship music or uh, church music, or gospel music, um, it's, it's a little bit of everything, I guess, but, but uh, um, you want to make sure that you had a, a good set of, uh, you probably want to check it out on a, on a set of normal stereo speakers and on a set of computer speakers in your control room just to make sure that, that the, you can hear the vocal and you can hear the snare drum and everything's coming through clearly. So, so that your, um, your, your, market, your, your genre, your market kind of dictates how, how you structure things it's to some degree. You know? Would it also matter if you're mixing it live to the stream versus mixing it live to, for an album? I, a little bit in that um, usually in the um, in television and on on the web there's a bit of compression happening uh, in the you know downstream of what you're doing the overall mix is being squished a little bit the loud parts are being turned down the quiet parts are being turned up and so you have to be able to uh, uh, compensate for that and, and not over compress your, your yourself you know uh, it will be too it'll be very undynamic and boring to the listener at home. Same thing with radio, radio compresses things very heavily. So whereas on a record, you might leave a lot more dynamic range. Uh, if I'm mixing for the web, I try to have a really good quality stereo compressor across my whole mix, like my mix bus, and try to squish it a little bit because I'd rather have control over that than some guy in a office in San Francisco, you know, I, if it's gonna be compressed, the first one in the chain is gonna do most of the work. So it might as well be me because at least I can control it with a high quality compressor. Whereas, you know, downstream, it could be some guy who's not even listening. Like he's just, he's gone out for a coffee and just set up a compressor at the broadcast station. Well, so, if it's like Zoom or a lot of the other ones, it's just a uh, mathematic equation that they say, okay, let's just squish it this way and that's that. Yeah, and it's, dep it's depressing for music because those things are set up more for the human voice, for talking, and it really, adversely affects your music mix it does things to your music that you really don't want to happen and it, you know when you squish the life out of things it, it makes things less exciting by, by by definition when you take away dynamics it's less dynamic it's less 
punchy and exciting. And so um, you don't want to lose the life of your recording. Um, and so you have to kind of work hard to, to make that to prevent that from happening for because you don't want the song to start and the intro is what the same volume and the verse is the same volume and the chorus is the same volume and the solo is the same volume and the outro and that makes for a very boring piece of music you the artist has loud and soft parts of that song that they want for effect and if you take that away from the artist you're affecting their uh you know you're affecting the, what, what they're trying to get over to the to the public and so um it, it's a it's a balancing act to try and keep it within a window without taking all the excitement out of it. I think, you know. Okay, I wasn't gonna go here, but you, you said uh, we're talking about the compression for the, the streams and for the live recordings for radio and TV. Do you actually go in and listen to the playback from, from this, uh, the TV or the YouTube stream? or the radio yeah. stream so you hear if they are compressing and what to what and then you regauge well, that and re what's funny is that the new technology has made that more difficult because in the old days when everything was analog if you were if you had an fm tuner inside the control room and you were listening off the radio you could a b it because it was instantaneous there was no delay there was no lag but now that we're doing everything digitally and it's being sent up to a satellite and back down there might be a five or six or seven second delay coming off the computer relative to what's leaving your console. So if you try to AB that, you, you drive yourself insane. And so that's where the experience comes in. I, I find with any new medium, and this goes back to when I did my first radio broadcasts, my first television broadcast, my first stereo television broadcast, my first surround sound television, I had to do a couple of shows and then go home and listen to it off the air. And you go, oh, that's what, I, like the vocal got pushed down or the snare drum, all my bass is gone or, and you make some notes and say, okay, next time I'm gonna do this so that that doesn't happen. So it's tough if you're only gonna have a one-off thing, but you get to know through experience what happens further down the food chain and you've got to compensate for that up at your end. And I guess the only way you can do that these days is to actually do a couple shows, tape them off, have somebody tape them off the air and then go home and listen and say, oh, that, you know. It's a bit of an iterative process. It takes you two or three shows of any new medium to kind of get a handle on it, I find, unfortunately. Yeah, that's just the I guess you'd have to compare that to your mix. You actually then have to record your mix. Yeah, yeah. I, what I do is, is I, I, I take the mix and make that a stereo Pro Tools file. And then I take the off air thing and, and try to line up the files and then sit there and AB them and say, oh, that, you know, and. and it's really eye-opening sometimes. It, it's really quite different. Uh, it almost depends on the network too. I found CBC doesn't really change things very much, whereas Global and and uh, CTV did. You know, they're, they're running it through a lot of processing and, and stuff. So, and when we used to do live radio broadcasts back in the day in the 80s and 90s, CFNY and Chum FM and Q107 all had different degrees of processing on their signals. And you'd have to sort of compensate a little bit. You know? So what, what do you do then if you're doing like a live stream and you're trying to record live for an album or a DVD and then you're wanting to turn that into uh, a, a, an actual album that sticks, sticks out? Like there's the live album slash DVD, there's the recorded album, and then there's the live stream. It's all being done at once. How would you, what's... Well, the, it's not quite being done at run months because the live stream is indeed live and that two mixes the serial mix you're doing live in the venue is very critical but you're also probably multi-tracking it onto pro tools for the album because the album is not coming out that day so so you would record that just the way you would in the studio you've got only the only difference is everything's happening at once so maybe you've got 20 or 30 or 40 tracks going to pro tools in addition to your stereo mix so while the event is happening you're paying very close attention to the stereo mix because that's what's going out now and keeping an eye on the levels on your multi-track, just making sure that they're nice and strong and clean and no reverb and no, no EQ. Or, you're just recording those tracks clean so that you can process them later on at your own leisure and mix it the way you would a studio album. So that's generally the way we do these things is that the stereo mix is you know, going out and, and then we're also multi-tracking. Often we have, in fact, these days, we often have two multi-track machines. We have two Pro Tools rigs or a Pro Tools rig and some other recorder because all the people watching this know it's pretty pro tools can crash it's not it's not a question of if 
you know, is, is my system going to crash? It's going to crash. What are you going to do when it crashes? Have a plan B. I never, I would say in the last 25 years, I have not done a gig where I haven't had two systems rolling all the time. And once a year, it saves my bacon. You know, the, you get a bad hard drive or somebody kicks the plug out or the battery runs out or, or Pro Tools just crashes. We've all had that. As, as Bob Ludwig so wisely said once, it's digital. Your choice is one or zero. So oh, that is awesome. So you better have a plan B because it is going to happen and you don't want to turn to the client and, and say, we, we didn't get it. Like, um, I like to think I've done this for 40 years, over 40 years. And one of the reasons I get hired back is because the rep I've tried to maintain is hire this guy and you will walk out with a show. I mean, they will figure it out. Like no matter what, you will walk out with something you can put to air. And that's the rep. You, you know, we, most of these gigs, you don't have a contract. People will say, you, I mean, I've been doing the Junos for 20 years. I've been doing the Much Music Awards for 25 years, the MMBAs. I've been doing the Country Music Awards for eight or nine years. But people say, do you have a written contract? There's no written contract. The contract is don't screw up or you're not doing this next year. Like, like we'll get, there's lots of other guys we can get to do this. So, so the contract is make it work because the show, this is the other thing about live television and live web streams. Unlike a studio where you can sit there and spend 30 minutes on the hi-hat and 30 minutes on the snare drum and 30 minutes on the bass drum and get everything perfect in, in the live broadcast business and live web stream business. Um, the show doesn't start because you're ready. The show starts because it's nine o'clock. So you better be ready because it's starting at nine o'clock, whether you're ready or not, you better be ready to hit record because they're going without you. Yep. And that's, that creates a certain mentality in the engineer. And I find when I'm hiring people, engineers that have had experience as a DJ or as a live sound mixer work well in my environment because I know those people, those men and women have had to have it together by nine o'clock. You know, even if you're a wedding DJ, you've got a room with 200 people and it's gonna start at three in the afternoon or whenever it starts. And if it doesn't, you've got 200 people looking at you and you may not get paid. So that creates a mindset of, I better have all the equipment in place to make this show start on time or I won't be doing this much longer. And that's what my the live business is in a nutshell is, is, is have two of everything that's critical. Two speaker systems, two amplifiers, two intercom systems to multi-track recording systems to Pro Tools rigs because because stuff blows up you know and, and you can't afford to you can't be the guy holding up the parade <laughs> like to put it yep um so because we're talking mostly live right now what is your thought process on building a mix for for live how do you go about what do you start with well particularly in, a, in any sort of worship music where the message is so important, you've got to build around the lead vocal. I mean, a fault that often a bunch of us engineers and musicians fall into, like we, when you, when we listen to records, we listen to them differently than the general public or than your sister or than your mom. Like, cause you know, you're listening to that guitar solo or the drum sound or the snare sound and the average listener doesn't do that. You know, um, they are driven by the message either the message that the vocalist is singing or the emotional content of the singer themselves. They're being moved by that vocal. So sometimes engineers and musician based engineers have a tendency to ride the vocal too quiet in the mix. And I've never had anybody complain to me that the mix, that the vocal was too loud in the mix, but sometimes you, my mom will, I can't make out the words, you know, and that's another thing that you have to remember is if you've been working with the band for a long, know all the words. Like you're filling in the blanks. Even if the vocal's too quiet, you know the words, so you're filling that in. Where somebody out there hearing it for the first time doesn't know the words. And so they need the vocal up louder than you'd think, like slightly louder than you'd think for it to cut through. Yeah. Unlike a rock mix where all the drums and bass when I'm mixing, gospel or country, where again, where the words are very important, I'll start with the lead vocal and get it sitting in the center with a little bit of reverb and I can make out the words and then I'll bring stuff in under it, you know, so that it's, and maybe pan things away from the vocal and leave the vocal some real estate in the center so that people can make out that message. Because ultimately that's what's gonna make them buy or not buy the, the record. They're not gonna buy the record because the floor tom sounded really good, you know? As much as we'd like to think that as engineers, we spend, you know, think of it guys, when you're in the studio, 
you'll think nothing of spending 45 minutes getting drum sounds. And then you send the singer out for about 30 seconds and throw a mic up and let's go, you know, and really, <laughs> you should be spending a little more time getting that, that vocal happening. And uh, that I, I used to do that when I was younger, I'd fall into that trap. And now I, I really, you know, do spend time choosing the right microphone for the singer, choosing the right headphone mix, choosing the right uh, distance from the microphone and creating an atmosphere where they're very comfortable. Do they want lots of light? Do they not want the light? Do they need a music stand? Do they need a, 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 a glass of, a cup of tea or a glass of lemon, lemon and water or create an atmosphere where they can deliver their best performance. And the other stuff falls in a lot easier then, you know, it's, it's all about catching the lightning in a bottle. You know? Capturing lightning in a bottle. That is. I, I, I worked with Neil Young a couple of years ago and at, uh, he did you know, for 30 years and I got talking to him while we were setting up and this is a bit extreme but never put a microphone in front of Neil unless the machine is record so that's the first saying it like why weren't you rolling I, I, I mean that's taking it to an extreme but that's an example like you want it the red light should be on as much as possible record everything that moves because you never know when that magic take is going to happen and for some singers it's take one for 38 but you better have the red buttons or you won't be working at that studio very long you know it's, <laughs> it's very very critical the whole thing we've got to i think we generally have to pay more attention to the vocal uh than most engineers and, and vocalists are happy to hear that but uh and it's i know i am i'm a vocalist <laughs> critical thing of the music <laughs> yeah you know and and so uh i'm not saying the band doesn't have to sound great but for most listeners, that's not their focus, you know. Um, it, it's, it's all about the, you know, think about, you know, when you go to somebody's house and you look at their CD collection and, and they've got like about 20 CDs and every CD has sold a million copies. Like the, the, what I'm talking about, the casual listener, the person who only buys, I mean, nobody buys CDs anymore, but you know what I'm saying? Like the, the, uh, most of their stuff is top 10 stuff. And so what all those records have in common, the vocals right in your face. Time after time, and sometimes you have to listen to music. Let's say you're mixing something that you don't normally listen to. Like for me, it would be opera. Let's say and I'm not a big opera fan. I don't have it on in the car when I'm driving around. Um, to the people that you're recording, that's the most important music in the world, you know. And so you've got to maybe make an effort the month before that to start listening to some opera at home or tuning to the classical music station. Where's the vocal sitting relative to the band how much reverb have they got on his or her voice you know when i started doing gospel i, I was it was a new thing for me I, the, the first gospel groups i did in toronto was a gentleman that some of you might know named oswald burke and he had uh, he was with the revival time uh, he had a band called the revival airs and this is when i had my little eight track studio on dufferin street and i said oswald i you know this is like i'm not too familiar with this style of music can you drop me off some, some records? This is even before CDs. Can you drop me off some albums that you think sound great? And I will listen to those for a few days before the session and just get a feel for what you think is a good sound, like, like what, where the vocals sit, where the band sits, how much reverb, you know, and, and uh, I do that when I'm dealing with a type of music that's, that's new to me, because I, you know, it's easy for them to play me something and then tell me about it, you know. It's easy for me to hear what they think is a good sound. Now, I can't make it sound exactly like, you know, a million dollar gospel record done in Nashville by, by you know, some famous, you know, one of the Clark sisters or something. Like, I've not that sort of budget. But at least I have a ballpark idea of what they think sounds good, and I can strive towards that. You know, that's, that's what I, I like to do. I'm still so, learning. You know, I'm 67 years old, and I still, I think every session I learn something that something happens that didn't happen before. You just file it away in your bag of tricks and say, oh, when that comes up again, I'll, I'll know to, to do that, you know. So you're working on the vocal, you got the, the, the vocal there. Yeah. How much time do you spend l looking for a verb or a, a, a delay? And what are you normally looking for? Because if you haven't put the band underneath that yet and you're trying to put that in fairly quick, yeah. How do you go about selecting what's a proper sounding verb? Oh, and what's a verb that's natural and it's a question.
what, 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 what room do you want them in, you know? Okay. Um, first, it's choosing what room do I want this singer to be in? Do I want them in a classroom? Do I want them in a small club? Do I want them in the theater? Do I want them in a cathedral? Do I want them in the Grand Canyon? That would dictate the uh, reverb that I'm using, usually the speed of the song. When I'm mixing, I generally set up three reverbs. I set up one reverb for the vocals, one reverb for the instruments, and one reverb for the drums. They're all slightly different times. The vocal reverb would be the longest, the instrument reverb would be medium, and the drum reverb would be fairly quick. Um, and usually I'll set up a couple of delays and the delays will be set to the tempo of the song. So hopefully it's a delay that has a tap button on it and I can just tap along with the rhythm and I'll have one delay on quarter notes and one on half notes. And that way I can, I can if I want to thicken something up, at least the delays are in time right. to the song. So maybe for a fast song, it might be 180 milliseconds for a, uh, like, like a real up-tempo gospel tune, it might be 180. For a, a slow ballad, it might be 320, 325. So it, it, the tempo of the song that dictates the size of the room, because you kind of have to have the reverb. If you have a reverb on a snare drum, for example, it's kind of got to die down before the guy hits the next hit. So on a really fast song, that snare might have to be, it might have to be 180 milliseconds on a, on a really slow song. It might be two and a half seconds. You know, it's, it's, it's speed dependent, uh, tempo dependent. Okay. And, um, after I've got the, the vocal sitting well, I'll probably, if it's a piano vocal, I'll probably bring the piano up a bit and have that, or organ, some keyboard, some chording instrument under the vocal, get that sitting well. And then I'll bring up the kick and snare. I always think the kick and the snare should be about the same volume. Um, one thing I do, I haven't mentioned this yet. One thing I do is I start in mono. I put everything to the center. Um, not every engineer does this, but I know a few people that do. And I find if you can get it really rocking in mono, it's real easy to spread stuff out afterwards, but if you can get the separation you want with everything coming down the center, then when you do splay it out, maybe put the guitar over to the right and the accordion to the left or whatever you're doing, um, then the vocal has a nice place to sit. But, but uh, if you can get the mix really solid and mono, um, it'll work in stereo. It doesn't always work the other way. So you can get a real rock and mix in stereo and you collapse it to mono and now you can't do the snare drum, you can't do the vocal or something. So I find that. I also try to have usually three monitor systems when I'm mixing. I have a large set of speakers, in my case in the truck here, the Gentle X. Then we have a smaller set of bookshelf speakers, near field monitors, um, like Oratones or something like that, like almost like, uh, you know, not very expensive. And then I'll have some mono, like a car radio speaker or a, Ghetto Blaster on the console. And that's kind of my cheapo, cheapo chord of last appeal. And again, I find if I can get the mix really rocking on the little speakers, it'll work on the big speakers. But if I get, if I start on the big speakers and get it really happening on the $10,000 speakers and then collapse it down to the Ghetto Blaster, it doesn't always work. Don't know why that is, but it seems that as a mixer, you want it to sound like when you listen to your favorite sounding albums, like really good sounding records, they work on everything. They work on computer speakers, they work on earbuds, they work in your car, they work in a club, they work when you hear it through a big PA at a church. Like that's the mark. That's why those guys like Tom Lord Alge and Andy Wallace and, and uh, Bob Clearmount get $80,000 to mix a song for Beyonce because their mixes sound good on everything. You know, it's just. It's a trick. It's not easy. It's not like it's something you learn to do as an engineer, but it's, it's really difficult to make it sound good on a bunch of different things. And that's the mark of a really great mix is that, that you should be able to take that mix into a stereo store where they've got 30 speakers on the wall and the button would switch between speakers and bang, 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 bang. And it sounds good on everything you play it on. It sounds good. You know, yeah. it's not that easy to do. Most younger guys who are used to their little studio in their home or their, their basement or their bedroom, they can get it rocking in their room. And then they take it somewhere else and it doesn't cut it, you know? Well, That's tough. a good chunk of that though with the bedroom is, and we're not, I don't even want to get into that. It's yeah. the acoustics. Yeah, it's a bad sounding room. You're, you're compensating for a bad sounding room or you don't have very good speakers or the room is inconsistent. Like you've got a door on one yeah. wall and getting soaked up by a curtain on the other side. If, if the room was not accurate, then you're basing you're making decisions based on bad information. So one thing you can do is try and take the room out of the equation. 
And the way you do that, I guess one way you do it would be to mix on headphones, but I've never had much luck with that. I find when I mix on headphones, I can get it really sounding great on my headphones. And then I play it on somebody's speakers and it never sounds as good. So what you can do though, is if you have the speakers far away from you in your room, you're hearing only about 10% direct sound coming to your ears and about 90% sound bouncing off your ceiling and your floor and your walls and all that. And since your room's not accurate, it might be perfectly square or something. Um, you're going to be making bad decisions because the reflected sound is inaccurate. What you want to do is get more direct sound. How do you do that? Put the speakers closer to your head. So if you have the speakers on top of the meter bridge of your console or on your desk, you know, within a couple of feet of your head, then, I mean, it wouldn't matter if you were sitting in the Rogers Center. If you're close enough to the speakers, you're hearing the direct sound. Your brain hears the direct sound before it hears the reflected sound. It tends to turn up the first sound that reaches its, your ears. And so it'll turn up that direct sound and turn down that reflected sound. And now you're, you're basing your decisions based on that direct sound, which is more accurate. So that's a good trick is to maybe have a set of speakers that are a little closer to your head if your room has terrible acoustics. And that way you're eliminating the room. You could be in a football field and it wouldn't really matter that the, if the speakers are close enough to you. you know? And so that's critical, I think, is finding a good space where the, where the speakers where you're hearing mostly direct sound and not much reflected sound. I mean, you'll even have sound bouncing, coming out of the speakers, bouncing off your console, if you have a console, into your ears. And that could affect things a little bit. So you, you, where the speakers are positioned is very, very critical. And I think having more than one set of speakers is critical. Okay. So, so, and then once you've got the speakers where you want them, get a great sounding CD from another source, like some million selling, Whatever it is you're mixing, if it's a rock CD, get a million selling rock CD. If it's a worship music, get a, you know a choir or a or a gospel group or whatever it is you're mixing, and that was done in some big expensive studio in New York or Atlanta or Nashville, and listen to that on your speaker system, your speaker system, and make a note. Oh, the bass is about here and the vocals sitting about here, and so if I make my record sound like that, it'll sound good in the outside world. You know the. Um, I do that whenever I'm going to a studio I've never been in before and I don't know their room and I don't know their speakers. I have a little CD, I, actually a thumb drive, with about seven or eight songs that I know inside out. The songs I've been listening to for 20 years. Some things that I recorded, some things that have been done by, you know, Steve Mann or... Oh, I went to the Olympics in Sochi in 2014 and they put me in a, a truck that was from the Netherlands on a German console with speakers I'd never seen before. And so I luckily had this th thumb drive with some of my familiar songs on it. And the first thing I did when I walked in that truck was, hey, can we listen to this for about half an hour before I'm setting up? And I said, oh, okay, that's what that, this room sounds like, you know? It, it's a little boomy. So if I mix my stuff to be a little boomy, it should sound good elsewhere. You know? So you need, it acts as your compass. It's your compass. So you, you need a little reference a USB stick with five or six of your tunes, you just have to know those tunes inside out. And you can walk into any room and, you know, acclimatize your ears to that room instantly. So that's, that's a, a good bit, bit of advice if you're, if you're a freelancer and you're working a lot of different studios. I mean, the other thing that some freelancers do is they find a set of speakers that they love, a little set of bookshelf speakers, and put them in a suitcase or a little road case, and they take those to every studio they go to. So they always have the same monitors and then buy a pair and just take those with you wherever you go. Say, hey, can we put these up on the console? I'd like to mix on these. But I think if you're a freelance engineer working in a number of different studios, it's a good idea to find a small set of speakers that you really love, buy them and bring them with you wherever you go. And that becomes, it's like your guitar or your saxophone, it's your instrument and it's, it's a safety blanket. You, you know, if I'm mixing on these, I know what the, the bass is the bass and the treble is the treble and I can, I know what I have to do on these speakers, you know, or else phone ahead to the studio. If you're going to Vancouver or something, I phone ahead. Hey, do you have a set of Genelec 1031s? No. Can you get me a set and put them in your studio for the, I'll rent them. You know, I just don't want to cart them on the plane, but I'd like to see a set of those speakers in your studio when I get there. And that way I walk in, oh, okay. I know what I'm walking into here now. I, I, can, I can deal with this. You know, it's like a cameraman getting there. It's the same camera that he uses back home. You're, 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 there's a comfort factor there that, you know what you have to do to deliver the thing to the client. So. Right. 
That's is awesome. We are, we are learning so much. I just want to invite our viewers again. Thank you. First of all, thank you for joining us. And we are hearing, uh, we are here having a discussion with Doug about how to get the perfect mix. And we're learning a lot of, a lot of, uh, neat tricks and if you're a singer songwriter um you might learn a lot too because one of the questions i have for doug is as a singer songwriter as a as an artist who who who's not in the on your side of the the field what can we do to help make your job even easier i think um well being prepared maybe already having figured out what the best i find that some singers come into the studio and they've chosen the wrong key for the song like they, they it's almost like they don't know their own strengths and their voices i find this a lot and just moving it up a tone or a, se a couple three semitones can totally change the strength of the vocal so i think finding the right key and finding the right tempo and doing this for free at home like don't be figuring this out in the studio when you're paying a dollar you're paying sixty dollars an hour in a studio that's a dollar a minute so if you spend five minutes figuring out the right key or the and also, you don't want to change the key on the band. They're, you know, at the last minute. I've, I've been there, man. I'm sitting there reading the paper, and they're rewriting the charts for the band. I'm making a dollar a minute reading the paper, watching these guys work this thing out, because they, they didn't find that out in the rehearsal hall. Um, another thing I think is good is finding the right tempo. Like, at your rehearsal place, try it at 90 beats a minute. Try it at 92 beats a minute. Try it at 88 beats. Find a pocket where you can get the words out. And don't be figuring that out in the studio. Figure that out at home where it doesn't cost you anything. Like have a little metronome or you can get a metronome plug-in on your laptop. You don't have to buy a metronome. And just, you'd be surprised at speeding it up. Like sometimes the song's too fast and you can't make out the words, you know? And people don't realize it until they get, actually lay it down and come in and listen to the play. Oh, that's too fast. Well, it's kind of too late to figure that out after you've done a take, you know? That should have been figured out two weeks ago. So, so my question to you, because you talked about being prepared and timing of the songs, if you're the mix engineer, do you keep your mouth shut on that? Or do you actually say, hey guys, should you maybe... Uh, it depends. If there's a producer, it's the producer's job to, to do that. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm just, you know, pushing buttons and turning knobs. And, and you, you sort of have to learn the vibe. Talk, if you know the producer well enough, you can say, hey, do you mind if I have some input here? Or... Some producers are totally open to that. And some guys are like, you're just a button pusher. Just, you know, turn out the fader. Here's a banana, you know? So, 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 so uh, um, you have to kind of know the, uh, some artists are very welcoming of that. And some, you know, uh, but quite often in the smaller situations, yeah, there is no producer. So the engineer becomes the producer and that way they're counting on you to also to tell if they're out of tune and, but it, there's a bit of tact involved. Like if you're, if, you're, if you're sitting there and somebody's singing out of tune and they're on take 17 of this vocal and, and they know they're out of tune and you know they're out of tune, but they don't need you hitting the button saying, hey, that's out of tune, let's do that again. You know, maybe, maybe you take one for the team. Like maybe you say, oh, sorry, man, I was a little late hitting the record button. I missed your first word. We're gonna have to do that again. You know, you have to be able to, I wouldn't say lie, but, you know, <laughs> whatever helps the record, you know, like ultimately five years from now, nobody's going to care if they did take 17 or 18, but you, you know, you, sometimes you have to be the bad guy. You have to get them. Now they're mad at you for missing the button and you might, that next performance might be, they might just ace it. And then you could tell them later on, well, I really did. Or you don't have to tell them, but whatever helps the record, you know? So I, I've done that lots of times. Like, Oh, sorry, man. I, I had the volume up too loud. We'll have to do that one, one more time. You know, eh. but, but hey, um, I think something that helps me as a mixer, this is more of a recording thing, I guess, but, but it's good to have the lyrics in front of you. I, I would get a photo, photocopy lyrics and give the company, they can write down where each verse starts, where each chorus starts. And, and, okay. and that way, if, they, if the singer says, run it back to the third verse, you're not uh what number is that you know like, uh, like if you have the lyrics and you've been writing down the start numbers of each verse you can roll oh that's 603 and go back to that point but if you don't have the lyrics you're just and then you get really confused if there's like three identical choruses and they want to roll let's go back and do the second chorus and you roll it back up oh is that where am i am i at the first chorus or at the second whereas if you have the numbers down you know where you are in the song you don't run the risk of erasing something they want to keep 
Right. Don't ask me. Don't ask me how I know that. But uh, you know. well, you don't have to worry about that with digital nowadays because you keep everything. Yeah, but <laughs> you know, it's just the speed. Like you want to work when they're hot and they're ready to. You know, they don't want to be waiting around for you to find the right chorus. They're they're in the they're and they're ready to go, and they. That's that's another thing too is that you want all, all your equipment working. You know, when you leave people on the floor, you want to make sure both headphones ears are working on the floor. You know, there's a buzz on the mic cable. When the singer and the musician arrive at the studio, they've been looking forward to this all week. You know, maybe you, it's another day in the studio. You know, it's another day at the office. But to them, you know, it's it's studio day. Like they're they're really pumped and they want to get in there and start recording and they might as well just walk in with a sign around their neck that says make me feel important because they're there's rock stars that day and it doesn't so you can't mail it in like just how can i put this like maybe just because they're not on the radio i mean they're paying exactly the same amount as israel houghton would in your studio they deserve every bit of your attention you can't be sitting there reading the newspaper or fiddling around fixing a piece of gear or on your phone. If they look down and they're pouring their heart out on the microphone and they look over and the engineer's sitting there on the phone, it's like really uh, uninspiring. I've, I've had musicians pack it up. I mean, there was a guitar player named Robert Fripp once uh, and Tony Arnold, this British engineer I know, was recording him and he was doing a guitar solo and Tony was doing something and he looked up and Fripp's putting his guitar back in the case. And Tony goes, what's wrong? And, and Robert goes, well, obviously I'm not playing well enough to hold your interest, so I'm going home. And and uh, that was a lesson learned. Like, man, like to that band, that you know, they 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 want to be rock stars for that day, and they deserve your attention. They're 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 paying top dollar, and uh, they're counting on you. They're playing their as well as they can. You you play as well as you can. You, you, you keep up your end of the bargain and do as well as you can too. You know, that's, that's part of the contract, I think. Because I, I used to get that, you know, when I ran a studio, I ran a Comfort Sound for 25 years. And uh, a band would arrive at our studio having started a project at another studio. And they're halfway through the project and suddenly they're at my studio. And I, after a, a couple of hours, I'd say, well, like what happened? Why didn't you complete it over at Studio X? And they say, well, we're a Portuguese folk band and, you know, they weren't taking us very seriously and they weren't paying really much attention and, and, you know, we just felt that we weren't being respected. And I thought, well, that's, it's sort of musical racism, you know, it's like, oh, you're not hip enough for me to pay attention, like, just because your music's not on the radio. Well, that's like being a photographer and saying, well, I don't like the looks of you, so I'm not going to take a good picture. Like, it's, it's, you're a professional. Your job is to record the music. And if that guy walks in and says, I want a Bob Marley guitar sound, and the next guy wants an Eddie Van Halen guitar sound, and the next guy wants a Garth Brooks guitar sound, you better know who those people are. Like, you can't go, oh, I haven't heard of that. And then they go, man, he hasn't heard of the main guy in my field. How can he possibly do a good job on my record? So you have to be a bit of a musical generalist if you're working in a studio, because you're not always going to be recording your favorite genre of music you're not getting paid to like it you're getting paid to record it so you know make to capture that performance so that somebody else can enjoy it 10 years from now or next month or 20 years from now and that's very special often you're the first person to hear that song next to the person that wrote it one of my friends says it's like walking into a museum and being able to go up and touch the paintings like you're you're in the room with the artist and they're pouring their heart out into this tune and you're, it's a real privilege to do what we do. You get to hear these songs first and help that artist get it onto a storage medium so that somebody else can be moved by it. And it doesn't really matter if they, if it makes them happy or if it makes them sad, or if it makes them angry, or if it makes them want to dance or it makes them want to put their fists through the wall. It has to move them in some way or it's not art, it's just wallpaper. And so think of the times when you've been driving in your car and you hear some killer song and you've got to like pull the car over. Like, who is that? Like, we're all here because sometime in our lives, all of us musicians and engineers and songwriters, that happened to us. That that feeling of that, where the hair stands up and you're like, oh, that's so, such a moving lyric or such a great guitar solo or such a 
killer song. I just, I want to hear, I want to go buy that so I can hear it 20 more times. That's what you're trying to capture on that little piece of plastic on your hard drive. Now, when you're at the concert, you know, it's hot and it's sweaty and the lights are flashing and you're with a thousand people and there's all this stimulation going on and you're really into it. When you're sitting at home hearing that on your, off a CD or off a, you know, off a Spotify or something, all you got is what's coming out of your speaker. So that better be larger than life because you don't have the heat and the lights and the sweat and the anticipation of you spent, a, you know, you just paid 60 bucks to be there and you drove and you parked and you got a babysitter and, you know, when you're listening to a record, it's just the record. So that record has to be larger than life to compete with that live experience. And that's your job as an engineer is to get that magic fairy dust onto that recording. I mean, think of your favorite records, you know, I'm, I'm going on and on here, but, but, but think of your favorite records. Like you can, you can maybe see your favorite movie four or five times maybe. Like you could read your favorite book two or three times. You can listen to your favorite song 500 times and still be, you know, there's songs you probably remember back from high school that it comes on the radio and you're back in high, like it's, we react differently to music. Like we're wired for music. I think music as an art form is really intrinsic in the human experience. I mean, they found tribes in South Africa, South America that barely have a language, certainly don't have a written language. I don't think they've ever found a tribe that didn't have music, some kind of, some kind of music. Like, like it's, it's, it's really endemic to humans. And so, you know, us having the responsibility of recording that for a songwriter or a singer or a choir or a band and getting it onto a storage medium so that it can be played back in an hour or a day or a year. Interesting. I love these thoughts that you're giving us. Are you frozen? Yeah, you were. Uh, it's yeah, all right. Well, I mean... I'm enthusiastic about it. I mean, I'm, I'm still, I love, get, I'm very fortunate that I've been sort of paid for my hobby for 40 years. <laughs> and and uh, I still love getting up in the morning. And, and uh, I mean, not many, you think when you're in your 20s, you think, hey, everybody gets to do what they want to do for a living. And then as you get older, you know, you realize that's not the case. And you go back for your high school reunion when you're 40 or, or your college reunion. And you realize that 80% of the people you went to school with hate their jobs. You know, eight hours a day, five days a week. And so those of us that are fortunate to work in, in music or the arts, um, I mean, that's not to say that, that other jobs aren't as fulfilling. I mean, I'm sure there are some accountants and some bank people and probably even some lawyers who love what they do. But certainly in music, I've, aside from the job, I've met wonderful people. I've, I've, uh, I've made some of my best friends through wood and wires. And um, it's, it's, it's a blessing to be able to uh, get paid for something that you'd almost do for free, really. Uh, it's very, very special. And then and, and it's it, with the live thing, unlike a studio, I mean, in Toronto, the studios tend to specialize. You know, you've got some studios that just do hard rock and some do country and some do children's records and some do gospel and some do reggae and some do commercials. And with the truck, with the live recording business that I'm in, everybody does a live album at some point. Everybody is on an award show at some point. So one day I'm doing a hard rock band and the next day I'm doing the Toronto Symphony and the next day it's a folk singer. And the next day it's the Toronto Mass Choir. And that's what keeps it interesting for me because to all those people, that type of music is the most important music in the world. And as long as there's feeling in it, as long as they're being moved by it, I can get into it, you know, whether it's, and then in Toronto, of course, Toronto being Toronto, a third of the music you get to record is Korean music and Italian music and Ukrainian music and, you know, uh, all these different language types of music. I've done a lot of uh, gospel music in other languages, but those people still have the, the same feeling as everybody else and you can tell it. And, and I love that part of being in Toronto is that it's, it's like, otherwise it's just like eating hamburgers all the time. That'd get pretty boring, you know. I get really bored just doing rock bands, all the bass drums, guitar, bass drums, guitar. I mean, that would be really tiring. So every time you record a new, I've certainly learned things doing worship music that I've applied to other types of choral music. And I've learned things, um, I've got a lot of experience recording Hammond organs through all the gospel stuff that I did. So when somebody shows up at my studio with a Hammond organ, I know how to do that, you know, because I've, I've done a 
a hundred gospel records with great Hammond players. And I, it was maybe the first five were a little dicey, but after a while we figured it out, you know? So, so every, you, you just file that away in your little bag of tricks and uh, you know, or you know, accordion music. Like for a while, my studio was across the street from an Italian accordion shop up on Dufferin Street. And we used to do, some of their students would come over and do accordions. And so about 10 years after that, when all these uh, Celtic bands from the down east started coming up with accordions and fiddles. Do you know how to record an accordion? Oh yeah, I've done about 50 accordions. I can do, or bagpipes. I know how to do that, man, I've done them. So even, you know, everything comes in handy later on, you know. I I've, I I've, I've did some gospel singers early on that were really loud singers. They are very, very powerful voices and they would overload a standard microphone. And, and I found a mic that would work with those people. And now when I run into a rapper that's got really loud mic technique, I, oh, he needs this mic that I learned that the gospel guys can't overload this mic. This guy will not overload this mic. So all these things, you know, you can't find two types of music that are more far apart, but those two things, he was like, how did you know to do that? Because 10 years ago, I had a gospel singer that blew me out of the water, Jerome Farrell from the Lighthouse Choir in Buffalo just about exploded one of my microphones because it was just, he was as loud as a good car amplifier. Yeah. Well, it, it just a loud, a good singer, but just really big man, very, very powerful singer. And uh, I learned that he just over, the capsule couldn't take it, just couldn't take the volume. So we had to put a mic that we'd normally use on electric guitar on his vocal because he was overloading the mic. Was, no matter where I set the volume on the console, I couldn't, couldn't stop it because he was 120 dB just coming out of his mouth. So, so, uh, you know, you learn these things and you file them away and then you get to be, the, like two years later, people will be, wow, you're such a genius. You know, no, it's because I made that mistake 10 years ago and I, I will make more mistakes, but they will be new ones. I'm not going to make the same, you know. Yeah. Big difference between having 10 years experience and having one year's experience 10 times, you know. It, it, it's, uh, you don't want to keep making the same mistakes all the time. So speaking of mistakes, let me ask you this. Three things to help young guys not make mistakes, or what are three major mistakes that young engineers, mixed engineers do, and what can be done to fix them? Um, well, there's a few things. I find that uh, overuse of compression is a serious problem in mixing over the last 10 years because People compress stuff when they record it and they compress it when they mix it and then they take it to the mastering facility and they compress it and then it goes to the radio station and they've got a compressor across. So by the time the guy hears it at home, it's been compressed five times and it's just like sawdust, like there's no emotion to it. So I've found myself over the last few years backing off a bit on the compression, letting the music breathe a bit more. Um, I think another mistake is not is working too much on their own. Like you want to get, you want to read as much as you can. There's lots of stuff on the net. There's a great chapter in Toronto of the Audio Engineering Society, which is an organization of recording engineers. They welcome students, they welcome young people. And uh, I've learned a lot just talking to those guys during the coffee break. And sometimes, you know, there's a lot of studio owners there. Sometimes you can wrangle a studio tour of them. Oh, you're with such and such a studio. I've got a couple of CDs from that studio. Uh, I'd love to check it out sometime. Yeah, come on down next Thursday. We've got another booked and check it. So that's becoming part of that community. And they bring in really good people to, to uh, speak to. If a, if, a, if a real hot New York or LA engineer's in town, uh, when the, the week the meeting is on, they'll have the guy come up and do a little presentation. Yeah, and you can learn some stuff from that. So that's uh, AES.org. Toronto has a really healthy chapter of the audio engineering. It sounds hoity-toity. It's not. They're just a bunch of people that love audio like you. So. I've been a member since I was a student, you know, when I was in my 20s, it's, it's, it's great. Um, what else, uh, let's see, not labeling things very well. Like, it's not, we're not allowed to be very often handing your stuff to somebody else and they shouldn't have to figure out what it is you gave them. It, it should be on the hard drive. This is a Pro Tools version 12 session, the date, and it's 48K and it's 24 bit and as much information as you can on the box or on a piece of paper when you hand it off to the next guy in the food chain. And that way they don't have to play a guessing game. Um, I find that people that don't trust studio you know, with a 35 track session and the tracks are audio one, audio two, audio, th you know, give it a name, <laughs> like vocal, bass, like, like document your sessions. 
I like on the comment section writing down what brand of microphone I use. Like, oh, we used a U87 on the vocal and we used a 421 on the guitar. Because then I can listen to it and say, oh, that sounds like that because he was using this microphone, you know? Um, so that's a good idea, having the times <laughs> of the song, and what, uh, what's on what track. and uh, So labeling things. Don't assume that you're always going to be the only person looking at this file. Like, what would you do if you handed it, hand it to your sister and she had to figure out, what, what, or your brother, and what was on it? It should be that well documented that somebody can pick it off a shelf and, and figure out, was oh, this Pro Tools? Is this Ableton? Is this Logic? Like, at least have that on there, what, what software and what version it was. Uh, or at the very least, your phone number so they could call you and find out. <laughs> well, you know, you these people have come with these mystery hard drives and I don't even know if, it, if it's Apple or PC. Like, like, you know, it's, it's a mystery. So, so it was easier back in the days of analog tape because we had, everything came in boxes and you had room to put sheets of paper in the tape boxes. But now, of course, on a little drive, yeah, but that, but that brings us back to exactly what we started off with yeah, right. when we were talking about you baking the, the, the tapes and yeah. you were actually saying that they weren't even labeled properly. Some of them were. Some of them are great. Like I've got, you know, here's, I mean, I've got some of these tapes I'm working on right now. Um, like a tape like this from, uh, this is a tape, this is from 19, it says November 13th, 1976, seven and a half IPS stereo master. Song title, artist name, that's great. And then you get these other things that are just a white box. So I had to put it up. Oh, it's a different speed. Oh, it's backwards. The, the front end is wound up, you know, like, 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 take five minutes and label the box. Because now this, these tapes are from the 70s, they're 45 years old. And so I'm here I am trying to figure out what's on them, you know. It's, there's, and then I get other stuff from professional studios, and there's actual track sheets and microphone charts and floor plans of where the musicians were set up in the studio. Those pieces of paper are 40 years old, but I can look at that and go, oh, that's how they did this, you know? So that, that's, it's handy to have all that information somewhere. I think it's a good idea to maybe have a text file as part of the file and just have it, they can look it up. It's a Word doc or something that has all that information on it. It stays with the music, makes it easier. So make it easier for the next guy in the food chain to figure out what the heck he did. Otherwise, you're getting the phone call at three in the morning. I'm over here in Vancouver and I can't figure out what you've done. You know, where's the vocal? Like there's seven vocal. Here's the other thing. I'll get a tape to mix and it's got seven vocal, lead vocal tracks on it. Okay. Which one's the keeper? Was track seven the best one? Was track four? Like, I don't know. Maybe put that one in red or a star beside it or keeper, right? Right, keeper on it. Like, don't send me seven guitars so because i gotta charge you for all that time listening to those seven tracks trying to figure out which one's the best vocal and then you find out oh well we want the first half of take five and the third chorus from take six and you know well maybe consolidate that before you send it to me don't don't make that my job i'm not the producer i'm just mixing it like don't because i don't want to choose the wrong vocal and then, then i get a phone call when i send it back to them well why did you use vocal seven well because it was the last one you did maybe i, I, I don't know I, I wasn't there now and that being said um here's another hint um when mixing sometimes it's a good idea to not have the engineer that recorded it do the mix down and it's hard to surrender your children you know but but i find sometimes you send it to another studio Here's what happens. You're in the studio with a band and the guitar player is out there trying a guitar solo and he spends like three hours on this solo, getting it perfect. And then when you listen to it, a couple weeks later, you realize, you know, this song doesn't really need a guitar solo. Like, and yet as the recording engineer, you can't go up to the guy, you know that guitar solo you spent three hours on? We, we ditched it. Like, because. You, you, you have so much emotion invested, you have so much time invested in that. Whereas if you send it to another studio to mix, that guy says, well, yeah, that doesn't work. Dump that. He has no emotional baggage with that recording. He's just choosing. It's like, I tell my students at Harris, I teach at the Harris Institute, I tell them it's like packing a suitcase. You've got, when you're mixing, mixing is making decisions. And 
you've got all this stuff thrown out on your bed and only a certain amount of that stuff is going to fit in your suitcase. So mixing is where you're choosing the stuff and trying to cram it into the, and only so much is going to fit in that suitcase. So that means you're not going to take five pairs of pants and seven t-shirts and four pairs of shoes. And like you've got room for one pair of shoes, one pair of pants. Like that's what mixing is. Only the decisions are basically four decisions. How loud is that track? So the volume. Um, panning, where does it sit in the stereo panorama? Is it coming down the center of the mix? Is it to the right speaker? Is it to the left speaker? Is it like 11 o'clock or one o'clock? Um, where is it in the stereo panorama? What um, is the EQ? Does it sound great the way it is or does it need a little more bottom or a little more top or a little less mid-range? Like, like what is the tonal balance? Is it good? I mean, in an ideal world, it would be good all the time. But in an ideal world, you're in a perfect sounding studio with a thousand dollar guitar and a thousand dollar mic in front of that guitar and the guitarist is really amazing. And you don't have to EQ that at all. It sounds great, but that never seems to happen in real life. Either the guitar player is not that good or the room isn't that good or you've got a $50 microphone um, or um, the guy's just not a very good player, you know, like, like and, and, or usually it's a combination of those things. So you have to compensate with your tone controls. You have to give it a little more bottom or you hear a sound in your head and you're not hearing that on the, on the recording. So you've got to tweak the EQ. And then the fourth thing is the ambience. Where is that guy playing the guitar? Is he in a phone booth? Is he in a classroom? Is he or she in a Massey Hall? Are they in the Sky Dome? Are they in the Grand Canyon? Like, what ambient space are they in? So you've got volume, ambience, panning, EQ, V-A-P-E, vape. <laughs> but that's how I remember it. Those four decisions you've got to make on each of your 32 or 48 or 96 tracks. I mean, you've got other decisions to make, but those are your four basic things when you're mixing. How loud is it? Where does it sit in the left to right panorama? Does it need more EQ or does it sound good the way it is? And here's the key with EQ. You may have EQ'd that drum kit when you recorded it and you had it rocking. It sounded great. But since you did the drums, you've put on five voices and five keyboards and four guitars and now that, and a saxophone, and now that snare drum's not poking through the mix anymore because you've got 12 tracks of mid-range instruments that are sitting right where that snare drum is. And now you find you've got to brighten that snare drum up. Even though you had it sounding great originally, when it was just the drummer and the bass player. Now, I thought I already EQ'd this. Well, now you've got to EQ it again because you've, you've put a whole bunch of stuff on top of that mix that is right in the range of that snare drum. So sometimes you EQ when you record and when you, when you mix, you know, both times. So you have volume, EQ, kind of, and the effects, like, like what, what ambience, where, where, what room is that guy sitting in? Do I want to, dry that there's right in front of my face. So that's, that's your decisions to be made on every track. So if you have 24 tracks and you spend one minute on each of those decisions, four and a half minutes, I've lost it. People will say, why did it take you three hours to mix a three minute song? Well, if it's a 24 track song, you've just spent 90 minutes just making those four decisions on each of the 24 tracks before you even start balancing the, the tracks. So it, it's, you know, it's, it, there's a lot of decisions to be made, but most of it is to do with what am I leaving out? You know, because um, it's, as a friend of mine says, I'm not producing, I'm reducing. <laughs> I'm reducing tracks. I, he says, I just go up um, and turn down the faders until it sounds good. It's, it's like when they asked a uh, Rodin about sculpting, how do you sculpt? a man, you know, a statue of a man. He says, I start with a block of marble and I chip everything away that doesn't look like a man. Right. <laughs> Same thing with mixing, you know, I, I, you start with the faders up and just take stuff away until, you know, until, you know, it sounds like a song. But uh, we usually record, I think we record way too much stuff. If anything's been happening lately because we have unlimited tracks, um, we kind of, tend to fill up all the tracks and maybe that's not the best idea. I mean, back when things were limited to eight or 16 tracks, the records were a little simpler and there were holes you could drive a truck through. 
Whereas now people feel, oh, we got 24 tracks. We better load them all up. Let's put a, let's put a triangle on there. Let's put a cowbell on, like something. No, maybe it's better off with just some holes between the notes, you know? It's, well, a, a space or a rest is yeah. the note. Yeah, yeah. It's what you, Leroy Sybil is this great um, Jamaican bass player that used to play in Toronto. I'm a bass player. And I used to do lots. Our, our studio was at Dufferin and Rogers, so we were very near the Jamaican community in town. So about 35% of the stuff we did between 1978 and 86 was reggae music. We worked with all these great guys, Jackie Matsu, and I learned from some really good musicians. And Leroy was this killer bass. He's back in Jamaica now. But he once told I was trying to figure out playing bass on a reggae part. And he says, Doggy man, um, don't play the obvious note, play the next one. And I've never forgotten that. It was, in other words, leave the one, leave the hole, and then play the next note, and, and it's, it makes it more effective. Like, like he, he was all about leaving spaces between the notes. He says, just, you can't play all the time. And uh, he also has a, <laughs> he also said, he says, if I catch you playing above the fifth fret, I will kill you. <laughs> okay, so it's like, man, uh, are we frozen here? There's already a guitar player in this band. And, you play the bass. Don't play up here. here. Here's a question that come up. A couple people have sent in a, a couple different times, and that's how has mixing changed since you started to where we are today? What's changed? How has it changed? Well, the Where's main change is, is the automation in mixing. In the old school, when we were using an analog console, you only had so many fingers to move things, and so. People laugh when I, I so students laugh when I say this, but I remember doing mixes and we had six people, the whole band would be at the console and each guy would have a fader move and maybe the guitar player would have his finger on the guitar fader and say, okay, when this counter gets to 106, you will mark this with two, with two, uh, with a piece of masking tape and some magic marker, move that fader up from the red mark to the green mark when the counter hits 106. Okay, drummer, I want you to goose the reverb on the snare drum up when we switch from the verses to the chorus. So everybody would have a job and you'd go through the three minute song and you'd get up to about 255 and somebody would make a mistake and you'd have to go back to the start and do it over again. Whereas now with Pro Tools and Logic and, and uh, uh, Ableton and the various types of stuff, Cubase, um, you work on a part and you store it. And then you work on another part and you store it. So mixing in the box, allows you one engineer to do the work of six or seven people because you, you, you're you not just limited to your 10 fingers. You can do more stuff. Also, you can um, work on one track at a time. You could just work on the guitar track and get that perfect and then move on. So I don't think it's taking any less time than it used to. It's just we have much more precision, much more control over all the elements and much more repeatability. On the downside of this, of mixing on the computer, is that We've lost what I used to call the happy accident. For example, let's say that we did a band and the guitar player did two different guitar solos with the idea that they would keep the best one. So he does two or three guitar solos. Okay, band, come back in and let's listen to the playback. Let's do the mix. And you're doing the mix and you accidentally leave both of them up. And you think, oh, sorry, man, I meant to fade. He says, no, that sounds great with the two solos. Let's keep that. Whereas, and that ends up on the record. Whereas with a automated mix on Pro Tools, once you automate something out, you'll never hear that again. Like that thing is muted and you'll never hear that um, mistake again. I, I have a great example again, I hope this holds together for this example. But back in the old days when we were recording on reel to reel tape, you got 32 minutes on a reel and a reel was $160. So you really didn't want to be cracking open new reels. You got 32 minutes on a reel. So that's whatever that is, $5 a minute for tape. I was recording a Toronto punk band called The Government, and they they did five takes of a song, and we were we reached the end of the tape, and they said, "Okay." I said, "Here's the option, guys: we can crack open a new reel and do take six, or, or we can go back and erase take one. Is there any chance we'll want to use take one?" They said, "No, that's been getting better, so I'm pretty we're pretty safe erasing take one." So I roll the tape back to the head of the reel. We, we rewind back to the start of the reel to do another take of the same song, go, to go over take one. But they played the song faster. So it ended earlier. 
So they come in to do a listen, and the song ends with a big bang like that. So we're listening to this new take, and they're really digging it. Sounds great. And their song gets to the end and goes bang. And then the tape runs another five seconds, and you hear the bang from the first take because they played it slower. And I was Sorry, man, I meant to fade that out. The guitar player goes, no, that's great. I love that. Yeah, they had to pl start playing the song that way live because that's the way it was on the record. It had the two guitar chords at the end, so they had to actually change the way they played it on stage because to play the two chords. So that's, a ha that, that, that's what I call a happy accident. And in digital, that wouldn't happen because you'd just do another take. You wouldn't go over anything, you just do another take. So some of these little things that were the medium limited us to the number of tracks we had, you know, where you, you couldn't do a new vocal without erasing the old vocal, because you only had four tracks. Those great Beatles records, I mean, they were erasing as they went because they only had four tracks. So it wasn't like, do you think you can do a better one? Because if you don't think you can do a better one, we better not do it because we got, we got nine erasing the nine out of 10 to get an eight out of 10. And say, no, no, I can do it. I can do it. And then they get out there and their voice cracks and you not only have got a bad take, but you've lost the previous take. That used to happen all the time in analog. That doesn't happen in Pro Tools or Logic because you keep everything. So that's, that's the thing is that people can afford to get sloppy. And I think they have gotten sloppy because when in the old days, you were, that was the take that you, you couldn't go back to the previous take necessarily. So it forced a discipline and there was a finite number of tracks. If that tape deck had 16 tracks, you had 16 tracks. Like you couldn't suddenly decide, oh, let's add a saxophone. No, you've used up all 16 of your tracks. Either we put that saxophone in the, in the vocal track where you're not singing in the middle of the song, or we just can't do the, the saxophone. So you had to plan it out. Whereas now with Pro Tools or Logic or anything, you just add another track, add another track. Back then there was a brick wall limit. You had 16 tracks or you had 24 tracks. That's what you've got. Everything's got to fit into that suitcase. So you are making decisions as you go. Now we, we leave all those decisions to the end and that means that the mix process is taking longer. Remember back in the old days when you'd go into a ice cream store, a mom and pop corner ice cream store and they had chocolate, vanilla and strawberry. And it didn't take you long to figure out what you wanted. And now you go into Baskin Robbins and it's almost, it's too much. Like, there's 35 flavors. How it takes you five minutes to figure, you know, that's sort of what we're at with the, most, the infinite number of tracks is that the older method, although it was limiting, it forced you to make a decision early on, which meant the mixing was a little less complicated because you had already done some editing on the way there. Whereas now you've got, you get to the mix stage and you do have, you've got five guitar solos and five lead vocals. And I don't know if you guys have ever talked much about comping vocals um, in terms of the mix stage, but when I'm doing vocals with a singer, I, this is where I need the lyric sheet. I have the lyric sheet, and I have five colored pencils, red, green, blue, yellow, purple. And rather than sending the vocalist out and working on the first line of the song and doing that a hundred times until they get it, and then moving to the second line of the song, then moving to the third line, I always find that makes the vocal sound kind of jumpy and not consistent because they're walking in off the street and singing the third line in the second verse and it doesn't sound like they're telling a story. So what I like to do, I like to send the vocal, get them all warmed up, get the headphones happening, send them out and say, okay, you're going to sing this song six times in a row without stopping. Bang, 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 bang. You're going to sing the next 30 minutes, you're going to do this song six times on six different tracks. So I send them out and they do it on track one. And then Back her up, track two, track three, track four. Okay, come on in. So now we've got six vocal tracks, complete vocal tracks. I take out that lyric sheet. I take out my red pencil and let's listen to track one. And we listen to track one and we underline everything that's good in red. Everything that's great. It's not enough that it's good, it's great. Everything that's great, I heard. Okay, let's listen to track two. And anything that isn't already underlined, that's great on track two, we'll underline in green. And then to the third track in yellow and the fourth track. And, and so by the time we've gotten through those six vocal passes, which don't sound jumpy because they sang the whole thing all the way through. So they told the story. Um, hopefully I've got every word in that song underlined with some color. And then I turn to my assistant engineer and I say, the singer and I are going to lunch now. And I would like you to take these six tracks and comp them onto track seven. Comp the greatest hits of those six vocals onto the seventh track. 
And when we come back, we want to hear that track solo. And in the old days, we'd have to crossfade on when the guy took a breath. But now, of course, with Pro Tools, you can get in there in between words and slice stuff up. So hopefully, we come back and it sounds like a continuous vocal performance that that guy could never do because it's actually the best parts of six performances on one track. But it's, um, it sounds cohesive because they did it all the same. If you come back two weeks from now, if you come back the next morning and do a, a new vocal, it's not going to sound, what's your voice like in the morning at 10 in the morning relative to what it is at nine o'clock at night? It's a different person. So if you drop in six words tomorrow morning, it's going to sound like Mr. Froggy, you know, relative to, it'll be obvious that it got punched in. Or if you're, maybe they put up a different mic, like a different, the studio has two Neumann mics and they picked a different mic, unless you marked it with a piece of tape. Or now you're seven inches from the mic rather than three inches from the mic. And if you punch in a sentence, a line, the next day with a, a different mic in a different distance with your different timbre of your voice, it's going to be obvious that it was punched in. It's not going to sound consistent. So if I send them out in 30 minutes and do six takes, that voice with the same distance on the same mic and the same state of voice, it'll flow better. And so that's a mixing trick I do is this, the, the color pencil thing. I was taught that by the guy who did all the vocals for the nylons, Peter Mann, the producer of the nylons, and he knew how to record vocals. They were an acapella band that only had vocals. And that was a trick I learned from Peter. It's, it's, it's served me well over the years. And, I mean, sometimes you listen through all six takes and there's still one or two words that aren't underlined and maybe you'll have to send them back in to do those words. But 95% of the time, somewhere in those six takes, there's a good take of every line of that song, I find. And uh, often 80% of it comes from one of them. Like usually there's the one take that's the killer. Usually not the first take, usually second or third. I find it gets better and better and better. And then it, yeah. it hits the point of uh, diminishing returns. And now for some singers, it's take one or two. For other singers, it's take 28, you know, but um, here's, a, this is not a mixing thing, this is a recording thing, but here's another trap that young engineers fall into is that they'll send the singer out or the guitar player to do the solo and the first one's got some mistakes and the second one's got some mistakes and the third time through, there's no mistakes. There's the keeper, let's keep that, that's the record. That's not the keeper, that's the first time through with no mistakes. Maybe that's an eight out of 10. Maybe if you sent them back out and they said, no, I didn't make any mistakes, no, let's try it again. Let's keep doing it until it starts getting worse. And then we'll pick the one just before that. But some, maybe take 17, like some singers, man, maybe take 17 to keep your take. Like, like don't stop doing takes until it starts getting worse. Because you might be, have a nine out of 10, then a 9.2 out of 10, then a 9.5. But you want, you don't want a good vocal you want a great vocal. People want great. Good is the enemy of great. You know, like you want, like you want a vocal where you, you can tell, hey, you gotta check these, check out this thing on, on this vocal I heard last night. Uh, these guys are great. Like people want to turn their friends on to great stuff, but good, there's lots of good stuff out there. You know, it's, it's, it's gonna be, be great. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or nobody's going to pay attention. There's, there's two. So here's something else that's changed over the last 20 years. When, when, when you had to have a record deal to get heard, to get into a studio, um, you know, there were only, only the people that were signed to record labels got record deals. And I mean, so it's like a funnel. And at the bottom of the funnel are the top 40, the ones that get on the radio. And then at the top of the funnel were all the people that had a record deal. And it was kind of like this, and that was cool. What has changed? in 2020 is that there's still 40 records on the top 40. So the, the tip of the funnel is still exactly what it always was. But the top of the funnel is like this because everybody who has a computer can make a record, you know? Doesn't mean they should be making a record, but they're making a record. So, so there's just the same amount. I mean, I, I'm, I'm an old guy and I've got lots of my old friends. Oh, there's no good music. You know, music isn't as good as it was 20 years ago. There's just as much good music right now as there was 20 years ago. The problem is there's way more bad music. Like, it's like way too many people are making records that shouldn't be making records. So you have to sift through all this crap to get to the really good stuff. There's lots of good stuff, but you need a filter. The record companies, you know, as much as we hate the record companies, they used to at least be a filter to the letting in the riffraff, but now, it's like all these people, it's like as if I went down to Staples and bought, hey, I bought the same pen as Margaret Atwood. Now I can write a novel just like Margaret Atwood, you know? No, you can't, you know? I could, 
I could uh, go down to Home Depot and buy a thousand dollars worth of tools, and it doesn't mean I could make this uh, cupboard that's beside me. It just means I have a nice pile of tools. And so there's a lot of people buying recording equipment. I've got the same microphone as Dr. Dre, the same uh, software, and yeah, but you know, it's it's the person operating the stuff you know it's like people say i want the same guitar as eric clapton and the same guitar pick as eric clapton and the same amp as eric clapton but how come i don't sound like eric clapton you know mm -hmm. well you know eric clapton would sound like eric clapton on a 12 dollar guitar it's 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 the 40 years of playing and learning how to hold the instrument and bring it up you know and and bob clear mountain could probably mix on a little mackie console and mix you a hit record you know it's it's nice to have good tools don't get me wrong but 85 percent of it is the people the experience of the people running the tools, you know. And so as engineers, as mix engineers, you want to get yourself into a position. David Green gave me this great advice. I don't know if I followed it all the time, but he said, get yourself in a position where you get paid for what you know, not for what you own. I don't know if that came through or not, but, but uh, in other words, people hire you. I, I uh, when I was working in the early years with Much Music, the head guy at Much Music was John Martin, a British guy. He passed away a few years ago. Great, great man. He was the head honcho of Much Music. And I'm a gearhead. You know, I'm like a lot of people on this thing right now. You know, we, we, we salivate over mics and reverb units and knobs and stuff. And I, I got this new digital reverb when they came out. And I went up to John. I said, John, I, I just got this new Lexicon digital reverb. It's going to make our show so much, so much more better. I'm like, you know, like that little annoying dog on the Bugs Bunny. Go, yeah, so swanking. <laughs> you know. and, and, and John goes, that he says, I'm a producer. I want to make two phone calls. Doug, can you be there September 25th? And on September 26th, Doug, can we pick up the hard drive now? He says, I'm sure I hire you because of you, and I'm sure you will bring the right tools to do the job. I've never forgotten that. It was, it's, it's very, very true. He says, get hired. You know, anybody can buy the tools. So get yourself a skill set so people hire you because they know that you will deliver for them. They only want, most of these producer type people and people that make the decisions, they aren't that technical. They just want, they want you to solve their problem with two phone calls. Like, I want to hire this person and I know the sound is taken care of. I, I got it. He says, Doug, the other thing he said was, Doug, I'm a video producer. I've got enough to worry about with the camera guys and the band and the record company and the venue and the broadcaster. Doug, we are so appreciative of everything that you have shared. I, I love one thing I really picked up is your enthusiasm. I just I was just soaking in all your excitement and your enthusiasm. You obviously get paid for what you love to do. I don't even think this is a job. I think this is your passion. I think it's awesome. And what I loved hearing was your your heart behind hey you know mix engineers are here basically to support the the singer and we can actually we're actually a team working together if we're prepared as in well you know if you're not passionate about it yeah yeah well we're part of the same team it's a team sport you know it's it is sport. and and, and uh, what you want to end up with we're not making shoes here you know like like we're making your name goes on it that's you know, right. your name goes on that record 20, 20 years from now your name will be on that record so you can't let anything go out the door with your name on it that isn't the best and sometimes i spend extra hours and you're not getting paid but i i think here's a common mistake that people make like if, if they've been at the thing for 14 hours and it's still and you're going oh should i do that again and then you have to ask yourself okay if this was 10 in the morning would i do that again and if the answer is yes then do it again like so just because you're want to go home, home 14 hours in but like don't don't let anything out with your name on it that isn't as good as you can make it well that's good advice that's good advice viewers i want to thank you for joining us for this live broadcast of of what makes a perfect mix i hope you picked up a lot about what makes a perfect mix and i hope you are sharing that you uh, you shared this conversation if you haven't this is going to be be placed on both our well it's on our facebook it's also going to be on our youtube so share the link and let people know about this you're gonna they're gonna learn a lot from from what was said here with, with doug and 
we are going to be back next week and i want to encourage you to tune in again monday 7 p.m we'll be live again with a whole different topic so i hope you will come and join us remember if you're on our youtube channel if you haven't already subscribe hit the subscribe button hit the ding ring the bell because then you'll get notified of when we have these great videos coming back on uh, and we don't want you to miss them so thank you guys again for joining us and god bless you and we'll see you next week doug you're absolutely awesome thanks for being with us